something is less than something. Can you tell me what you expect Z star to be? Would you expect Z star to be negative or positive? Negative. Because if your claim is that it's less, then you expect winner. Then you expect your sample to be below, right? If I'm claiming that it's really less than what somebody thinks, then my sample better be freaking well let me do this one. That was right. Better be less. You with me? So on some of the tests, you got to the Z star part, it's, and you were saying if the Z is greater than 1.96 or whatever, and then you were getting negative Z stars, those totally don't match up. It doesn't make any sense. If I, if the show evidence I have to be up here and my sample is down there, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I even do the whole test? If, if I want to show it's up here and my sample's over there, well, screw that test. I'm not even going to do it. So, so those kind of things point out that there's an issue, there's a problem. They should be on that side, if we talk about that side. Okay. Uh, so, formula sheet. Um, we've got the big three in chapter seven. Remember, those are the ones that tell you when to use a Z, when to use a T. Use a Z when you know the population standard deviation. Use a T when you only know the sample standard deviation. Of course, they both have to have a normal distribution. Yeah. What if they say that the uh, same deviation is known, but they don't give it to you? Then you can't do it. You don't have a number to stick into the formula. So you can use T. You can't do that because you don't have a number to stick into the formula. Okay. Um, so that's not going to happen. All right. So there's the big three confidence intervals, right? The only time you use these formulas is when I ask you to create a confidence interval. There were a couple of people that were using this formula on the hypothesis test. Never would that show up there. Only when I ask you to do a confidence interval. Then there's these two little problems here. Remember those were to find the sample size you need? So if you want to be within something, you want to be really close to the real score, you're probably going to need a really big sample to do that. Because the larger the sample you take, the more certain you are about what you see. So that's how to measure exactly how large of a sample you should take. What does E stand for? Yeah, what's E stand for? Error. Error. So that, the magic word with that from a problem would be within. within. You want to be within 2%, so that would be 0 0.02. You want to be within 2 millimeters, so that would be 2. That's how much you want to be off by at most. That's your error. Cool. All right, so that's all chapter seven. Um, and chapter eight, the only new formula it really gives for chapter eight is, uh, you, you can write this one down. This is an oldie. All right, that, we knew for that one already. We knew that one from chapter six. Um, Here's the only really new formula. If you really want to help yourself out, you can put on your formula sheet the way that you put it into your calculator. Because I noticed a couple of people had some calculator errors, meaning they closed a parenthesis too early or they didn't put the top in parentheses. Right? If you want to put this all in the calculator at once, you have to tell the poor calculator <coughs> what the top is, bless you, what the bottom is, what's inside the square root, because he has no eyes. He or she has. Uh, let's see. Um, would it be correct to say that n equals t squared? Yeah, that's fine. If you have a t S problem, you could put a t there instead of a z. Over t. Yep. Doesn't really happen that often, but yeah. If you have a t problem and you want to estimate a large sample, you could put the t score in there. But it'll be an estimation of that. 
Yeah, but again, the T is always bigger than the Z, so you're being more conservative, so it still comes out in the wash. He's an interesting phrase. So any questions on that? I think that's it. Anybody have any suggestions? I'm always open to suggestions. I can turn them down pretty quickly. Yeah, P hat equals X over N. Sure, what the hell? This actually messes people up sometimes, though, so you got to be careful. All P hat is is the percentage you make from the sample I give you. So if I said I talked to 80 people and seven of them like tuna, then seven out of 80 is your P hat. It's, don't make a big deal out of it. It's just the percentage I see in my sample. When people look at the formula, they start thinking, oh, crap, i got to calculate X and get in from somewhere. It's funky things. So only put that down if you have any trouble with P hat. That's going to help yeah, you. Yeah, that, that does help. Good. All right. Yeah. Well, what's P? Probably it's what? Well, let me actually ask that question again. What is P? Probably that's for a population, because the hat means it came from a sample. So the difference between this, and I don't really want to make a huge deal out of this. Here, I have no freaking clue what P is, right? I don't know what the true proportion is. So I have to use my estimates here. In a hypothesis test, we're assuming this is true. I think that the percentage is 70%. Okay, well, I'm gonna use a 0.7 there then. That's why these don't have hats. Because I can use the actual P and Q. So in the one problem where it said less than 90% or more than 70% on the quiz, P was 0.7 or 0.9. P hat was what you got from your sample because it's got a little hat that means it came from a sample. Like the X with the bar means it came from a sample. Yeah. Uh, okay, for something that says uh, I find a mean final grade of so much, I find a mean of so much with the standard deviation of so and so, how do I know that this is a standard deviation for a sample or not? All right, so two things. If I have a population standard deviation, I have to make it incredibly clear because most of the time we're not going to. Okay. So I'm going to say things like, population standard deviation is known to be. Okay. But if I say I take a sample of 80 people and I find a mean of this and a standard deviation of that, where did that standard deviation come from? The sample I took, right? So I'm not always going to tell you S equals 7 to make it totally obvious. You have to think about it for a second. Did he say it was a population standard deviation? No, so it's more than likely a sample standard deviation. <coughs> and yeah, it is because it came from a sample. Cool. So I saw a few too many people putting down there, well, we know a standard deviation, so I can use no, not a standard deviation. To use these scores, you have to know the population standard deviation. To do anything, you have to know a freaking standard deviation. But T scores were invented to cover us from when we only knew the sample standard deviation, which is just an estimate. Okay. Yeah. Do we need to know the error correction thingy? No. So any other suggestions or questions about the formula sheet? Yeah. What's the formula for um, the new standard deviation in C star again? Yeah. Oh, right there. Okay. Cool. And if you want to, obviously don't bring in formula sheets that you maybe have lost points on. But you can bring in all your damn formula sheets. I don't care. You can bring all your formula sheets for every test for the final. You can bring a big old stack of formula sheets. As long as they're all just formulas or the accepted words that we've talked about. So you don't lose points on your freaking formula sheet. That's crazy. Don't do that. Right? Don't write more than you should. It's not fair. You're going to lose points. You can bring them all in. I don't care. You can bring them all in. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I heard you this. But what is the, that thing, X bar, what is that in English? What is that called? This year? Or this year? Oh, well, yeah. This is the standard deviation for the sample means. Oh. And, and just to point this out, on the calculator, when you do it, doesn't it give you, uh, you remember what it gives you first? I think. Doesn't it give you those? Yes, right. So that's the standard deviation for the individual scores. Whereas this one is the standard deviation for the means of groups of scores. Oh. And that's why that's the adjustment I have to make when I actually I'm talking about a sample oh. instead of individuals. So in general, we don't write those. But I kind of find it kind of cool that the calculator does. The reason it does is because it's a Y or an X. But still, it's kind of nifty to see that's for individuals. 
that's for means of groups of things. Cool. So we're taking a bunch of samples and we took their mean and their sample. Well, what we do is we take a sample, but to find the standard deviation of all samples of that size, we do this. How can we do that if we don't know the standard deviation, the population standard deviation? Well, then you do, or you do this. Same formula rule, really, right? Whatever standard deviation you have, you have to adjust it to be a standard deviation for a group of things. Can I write that on there? Hell yeah. Anything that's on this board can be in your formula sheet. Not anything that was ever on this board, but anything that's on this board currently. Uh, do we have a, uh, a formula for finding the P after we get the Z star? That just comes right out of your Z score chart. And then you just one minus. So on the test, I'll give you a z-score chart and the t-score chart, so you'll have both. Can I have uh, z-star equals x-bar minus mu all over um, s sub x-bar uh, instead of a sigma sub x-bar? If you want to, sure. Okay. All right, so now, I think we're all good with the formula sheet. And again, you can bring in all your formula sheets, I don't care. Just got to turn them all in. So now, any questions on homework or the practice test, or um, you want to do some more examples? Yeah. Eight point four number four. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. This problem goes back to something we talked about back in chapter one. You could have statistical significance, but doesn't mean that there's practical significance. So if I found out that I, if I slept 20 hours a day, that I'd live a month longer on average, that could have statistical significance. You could do a whole hypothesis test and prove that, yes, that there's evidence that these people that slept 20 hours a day do live a month longer than would have been predicted. You, you with me so far? Is there practical significance to that? Will you suddenly start only being awake for four hours a day just to gather an extra month of life? That's a personal call, but I'd say no. Some of you guys are going, I already sleep 20 hours. <laughs> Got that extra month locked up, man. But, uh, do you, so there's statistical significance, means, which means there's evidence that there is a difference. That's the whole point of hypothesis test. Is there a difference between this number and what we, and, you know, what we think it is? Is there a difference between what we found in a sample and what was accepted before? Cool. That's what hypothesis test is. So I can show that there's statistical significance, but then we step back and say, well, now do I want to change any of my habits because of what I just found? That's practical significance. Do I actually does it tell me something about what I should do in my life? You with me? So if it was found that if you spend $20 million more in advertising, you'll pick up two more customers in a year. And that could be statistically significant. You do the hypothesis test, yes, there is evidence from the sample you've taken that it is different, it is a little bit more. Practically, screw that. We just save the $20 million, depending on what business I have, but still. Practical significance versus statistical significance. So in this problem it says, 40 no, subjects had a mean weight loss of 2.1 pounds. There's no calculations on it, right? There's no calculations, yet. Does a weight loss of 2.1 pounds, pounds have statistical significance? Does it have practical significance? Yeah, so that's the difference. Okay. Any other questions on, yeah? Oh, okay. All right. So, where'd you have trouble with that? Is that so? This is the loaded die problem. Everybody has this here. Now this board is no longer your formula sheet, right? Can't write what I'm about to write down. 
Um, so if you want to look, here's an example of a, a hypothesis test, page 418, number 12. So what happened is they, they took a die and they weighted it. They weighted the die. Normally a die, what would be the average value you'd expect if you roll the die many, many times? What's the average number you should see? Three and a half. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, right in the middle is three and a half. So normally it would have an average of three and a half. So he weights it. He drills holes into it, weights the die, and he gets a sample average. He does it 16 times. So 16 rolls of the die. And he gets an average of 2.9375. And we know that the standard deviation, 1.7078. So that's the summary of this problem with the setup is. So he wants, what he wants to do is he wants to test this versus what it normally would be. Is this evidence that he's actually weighted this die? He's done it 16 times. He definitely got less than 3.5, but he only did it 16 times. Is that by itself evidence that, in general, his die is less than a regular die would be? You guys semi with me? So normally he would get a 3.5. Now, if we roll the die 16 times, will my mean come out to be 3.5? No, I'd almost put money in it not. It's going to be a little more, a little less. So the whole idea of hypothesis test is you just did a sample. Is this number different enough from what I expect to be evidence that it's different? So I don't care that that is actually less than 3.5. Is it less than 3.5 enough? And that's what step three is, what's far enough away, <coughs> rejection region. Step four is, how far did I make it? Did I make it far enough away or not far enough away? OK, OK. So let me see, what else did I tell you? Use a 0.05 level of significance. OK. So the claim he's making, let me see if I can blah, 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 blah. Test the claim that outcomes from the loaded die have a mean different from the value of three and a half expected. So what's the claim? In mathish. Some of you guys wrote it in English and I said, no, 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 mathish. So what's the claim? The mean is going to be how compared to the three and a half that a normal die would do. Less than. Less than. Or not equal to, actually. Here it's less than. The claim is that it's different from the value of 3.5, so not equal to 3.5. So which one is that going to be, the hoe or the high? All right. Good. It's going to be the high. Don't forget the symbol and use the correct symbol. For a test of a mean, it's got to be mu. For a test of a proportion, it's got to be p. Not equal to 3.5. So what's the hoe? Equal. Equal to 3.5. One or two tail tests? Two. Two. That's the only time it's a two-tailed test when it's not equal to. All right, what's the next step? Nope. Rejection. Not quite. No. Yeah. It, um, is it normal, and can I use a z-score or a t-score? So this guy, I love this guy. Let's see. Yeah, I love it. It's awesome. So we're going to have to assume it's normal. What was N? 16. Is that enough? No. But we're going to have to assume it's normal. Now, what tells me if I've got to use a T or a Z? Standard deviation. Yeah, which standard deviation do we know? Population. Population. Yeah. Right. How do we know that sigma? In this problem, it's because we're in the section where sigma is known. <laughs> to be honest. 
because they really he didn't really write it very well. Assume that the standard deviation of the outcomes, which is the standard deviation for a fair die, so that's just the standard deviation for all dice, is that. So that's my population standard deviation. It's not something that we got from a sample of 16. Is there a way to calculate it knowing um, the probability of each number? Yes, of course. All right, we know P is 0.5, Q is 0.5, N is 16. We can actually check this out. My right, standard deviation would be square root of N, P, Q. But let's not worry about that right now. It's right there, folks. Um, so we're allowed to use what then? C scores. So now what's the next step? Set up the rejection region. Good. So now the next two steps are really the heart of my hypothesis test. Tell me what far enough away is. What's my benchmark? And then step four would be, did I actually hit that or not? So here I know for step three, or in this case C, alpha is 0.05. I have a two-tailed test. I'm using Z scores. So can somebody tell me what those Z scores are going to be? 1.96, cool. Two tails, right? Alpha 0.05 and two tails. Cool. So maybe take a second to make sure that you agree with that. This is something you have to do on your own next week. So make sure you can see you get 1.96. So if you look up alpha 0.05 in two tails, so you've got to look at the second row, 0.05 in two tails, all the way down 1.96. <coughs> So how do I say this in words then? Yeah, how would you describe this region? I'd say if anything, if the Z star is less than one negative 1.96 or if Z star is more than 1.96, what can we do? So again, real quick, the null thinks that it is three and a half. And where in the picture is the mean? The three and a half, it's right there. So of course, if we get in here, that looks like this is wrong. If we take a sample, and if, if this is true, if the three and a half is true, and I take a sample, the sample should be close to that. That's why this is so tall, because it's got a big probability to be there is very unlikely for it to be way out there. So if I do get a sample that's way out there, that's evidence that that middle's not in the right place. Let me say that again. So if this is the real middle, any sample I take, if it's truly a random sample, should be near it. So if my sample is far from it, far enough, and now we've defined what far enough is. If my sample is far enough away from it, that's probably not the real middle. Because what's the chances that the sample, that it really is the right middle? That I just randomly picked one that was way up or way down. The chances of that are 5%. So what's more likely? It's the wrong damn middle. But again, I love that about statistics. It always says, oh shit, I could have made a mistake. Type 1 or type 2 error. Because right? that's real life. So now I know my benchmarks, my 1.96 but negative 1.96. Now I test to see where my sample ended up. X bar was 2.9375. Sigma is 1.7078. What do I do before I make a Z score? Good, change my standard deviation. Divide by square root of what? 16. So now I can do my Z star. Now I can use the right standard deviation to get my Z star. To see how far apart my sample is from what the clay, the, the null says it is. So it'll be my data point, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 
three seven five minus no jet is a five minus the three and a half I see here divided by the new standard deviation. So the null always has an equals in it, right? Greater than, less than, equal to. It always says I have a greater than, equal to, less than, equal to. So it's always going to be related to that number there. So I'm trying to find a sample to compare it to this number to show that the sample I got is so far from this number. That's why it makes sense that I subtract those two numbers. My thing that I found minus the number I'm kind of like fighting against. I, don't, I want to show it's different from this. Is that all right? This formula just kind of makes sense. I want to see how far apart they are. But it's not good just to subtract them. I want to see relatively how far apart they are. So I've got to divide by how far apart things would be normally. They're about this far apart on average. So what do you get when you divide that? It looks like negative 1.37. Roughly. Is that right? Uh, oh, oh, I see. Negative 1317? Oh, yeah. Okay. So did we make it far enough away? No. Let me back up here. We only made it to right there. Let's say. You with me? So it was different from what I expected, but it wasn't different enough. Hell, I wouldn't even use the old definition of unusual and call that unusual, right? That's within a couple standard deviations. And now our idea of unusual has expanded. It can change, but it's, it's still not out in the unusual area. I'd expect to get something like that if I just randomly pick. I get something down here, something up there, something closer, something further. Who cares? It's not far enough away to go, holy crap, it can't be three and a half because it's so far away. It's not far enough away to say that. So what do I say right here? A little quick phrase. Good. We fail to reject what? The hope. Fail to support the high. So when you're about to go to your next step, When you're about to go to your next step, this is the only other time you care about your claim. You come back, what was my claim? Which one? The high is my claim. So don't say this. Use that language. Don't say H1, though, in your conclusion. H1 is this claim. So I'm going to say we have not found, we failed, so we have not found sufficient evidence to support the claim that throw in the language. So now step E, we have not found sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean of rolled weighted die is not equal to three and a half. So it's not enough proof to say that he weighted this correctly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one real quick thing. How do I find the p-value? This is about negative 1.32, just to round it to two places. So if I look that up, my p-value is going to be the area in the tail of my z-score. In this case, it's a two-tail test, and this is the one step that we all love so much. But to make it fair, I've got to double the damn thing. Alpha's in two tails. So whatever I look up here for this tail, I've got to double it to make it fair. So what do you look at negative 1.32, what area do you find? Yep, and so the p-value would be twice that, 
1868. Would you say a p-value? Just looking at the p-value. What what kind of a p-value would be good if you're trying to reject the null? What kind of a tell me something about the p-value that you'd want if you want to reject this guy? The p-value should be small, which means you have a small tail, which means you're pretty damn far away. That p-value, just looking at that by itself, that p-value is damn big. So if I was writing a journal article about this, I would just give this number. So the p-value we found was this. And then all the other statistic statisticians reading this would say, oh, that's not proof of anything. OK. You know, which could be all right. I mean, maybe I didn't want to prove that this was wrong. So it's OK to put that down and say, we didn't find evidence because of this. P-value wasn't small enough. Yeah. By small enough, do you mean like one half of the alpha? In this case, p-value would have to be, uh, the p-value had to be less than alpha, one, not one half. Mm -hmm. See, that's the point. If I didn't double this, I'd have to cut him in half to make it fair. Yeah, okay. If I double him, then I keep him the way he is, because alpha's in two tails. I have to double this to make it fair, to compare. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can do either one or the other, but what's done is we double the area to make it the p-value. Um, how's alpha one half? Say again, sorry? No, he was saying cut alpha in half. But instead of doing that, we doubled this area. You could do one or the other to make it fair to compare. How much alpha is in this tail? How much area is in this tail by itself? 0 0.025. 0 0.025. So you can compare this number to 0 0.025 and say, well, that's definitely not small enough. But what we do in general is we just double that so that we don't have to change alpha at all. Good. Yeah. Uh, how does the book write Z star? I think they write Z C if I remember, or Z alpha over two. Z sub alpha. Over no, that's for uh, confidence intervals. I think for here they use Z C. Sub C. Yeah. Z. Is it okay if I change it on my uh, test sheet? Z star. Two. Certainly. Z star equals Z sub C. Actually, no. They don't even use that. They just say Z. Yeah. Some books use that ZC for critical Z score. So they use ZC. Exactly. That's why I decided myself to make Z star. Yeah. And the star is visual then too, right? Yeah. Okay, so on the quiz for the confidence If there's 90% confidence, how much is in two tails? The remaining 10%. How much is in one tail? 5%, 0.05. So if I were to look it up, I could so look up the T chart set up. So if I have a 90% confidence interval, that relates to the 10% in two tails column, which that same column is the 5% in one tail. Of course it is. Because if 10% is in two tails, 5% is in one tail. So you almost can't go wrong either way you look at it. Just make sure that amount's actually in one or two tails. Okay, I looked at like the one that was like mm. in two five percent two tails. Gotcha. Okay. Got a question down here. On the quiz? Uh, yes. I'm trying to find the me. We're supposed to find the P star. Um, For number two, it's a P problem. N P Q. So you need P hat. What's the 45 degrees of freedom rate? Look at number two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is supposed to find this? This star 40? No, we're using this one. And we're not using T's either. It's a Z score because in, uh, NP and NQ, especially for you, is bigger than 5. Okay. NP and NQ bigger than 5 is normal, so I use Z scores. So you definitely use Z scores. Uh, you never use what for a hypothesis test for a P? You never use T-scores. It's either normal, you use Z, or it's not normal, you do nothing. So for a hypothesis test for proportions, NP and NQ greater than 5 means it's normal, you use Z-scores. NP or NQ less than 5 means it's not normal, you do nothing. Unless your instructor says, do it anyway. Okay. 
How are we doing with chapter 10? <laughs> oh, yeah. Which one, sorry? Six B. So it's, uh, oh, I forgot to give you the, no, on the actual test, I'm going to give you the R value. In fact, somebody came to my office, and i got to remember to say this. In the Chapter 10 homework, they do ask you to look at that chart that I looked at. So that chart, if you don't have the insert, it's in the insert. It's table A5. Or it's on page, um, let me find it. Here, page 608. So remember, that's the one you just look up your sample size, and you can see what R you need to show that it's correlation or not. Okay. So on this problem, I had a sample size of, what was it now? How much? 17. 17. So if I look on page 608, for sample size of 17, my cutoff scores are 0.482 or 0.606 depending on which alpha I want to use. So it blows both of them away, right? It's 0.808. It's way bigger. So that's why it's this decently strong positive correlation. It was positive, and it was bigger than the benchmark score from the table. On the test, I'm just going to tell you that. I'm going to say the R to compare it to would be 0.403 or whatever. Right? So if it's bigger than that, you found evidence is correlation. The bigger it is than that, the closer it is to 1 or negative 1, the stronger it is. So if you got 0.98, you just say this is a damn strong correlation, positive. Cool. I like number 6 because I, I, I like giving you data that I actually couldn't find anybody doing the analysis. This sounds like a decent analysis to do. It sounds sort of like it's very obvious. But it isn't really exactly obvious, and it's interesting to see just how strong a correlation is. The percentage of people with at least a bachelor's degree versus the average income in that state, there should be a correlation. But it'd be really interesting to me to see, like for example, on part C, 6C, that's where I ask you, predict what it'd be for a state that has 20% with a bachelor's degree. So you plug a 20 into the equation. That's like Wyoming. Wyoming has almost 20% with a bachelor's degree, right? at least a bachelor's. You get a number that's much lower than Wyoming's average income. So for some reason, Wyoming makes more money than I would, than I would predict. That is the interesting part of this study. So people would say, why are you wasting money? You hear about these studies. Of course, the more bachelors, people that have bachelors or higher degree, there's going to be a higher income in that state, of course. Well, then I can look at things like that. Why is Wyoming against the trend? Why are they making more money than I predicted? Or why is another state making less money than I predicted? That's the interesting thing that comes out of that. It's because they have a smaller population. Could be. One thing might be a smaller population. They have a different economy, right? They certainly have a different economy than some other state might have. Yeah. Okay. So you guys want to do uh, Example problem. Do you want to try out number six right now on your own to make sure that you get? I'll give you the answer key here in a minute. How many of you guys have actually tried number six on the practice test? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So maybe it's a good idea to go ahead and try that right now. So if you need to borrow a calculator, there's some up here. If you have a specific question, you can call me over. And it's always the total number. So this is the oh, yeah. score, so I'm supposed to use this number. I think you're right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, 0.05, 1 delta, so like so, so now, the pressure hat will be, so we're at, good, which is 38 seconds. Oh, we forgot our test. Dang, bro. Talk about no And in fact, don't even, that's what I meant by the formula getting in the way. If I can just look at the sample, what percentage did I find in my sample? 38 out of 